Welcome to the Medical Menemist Podcast, your source for memory techniques and accelerated learning in higher education. Now, here's your host, Chase DeMarco. Welcome back for another great episode. I'm your host, Chase DeMarco, and this is going to be part two of our recap series, our mini series, the best highlights from all of our episodes in 2019. All of our interviews, tutorials will be summed up in these interviews to save you a lot of time in case you weren't able to listen to every episode last year or just as a refresher if you've already listened to them. In part one, we covered study efficiency, pre prep rules and organizational tactics, note taking, flashcard techniques, and now we're going to continue with the other topics that we weren't able to get to in part one. To check out part one, go to episode 46 at freemeded.org slash podcasts. But before we continue on with today's episode, I do want to thank all of you that have reached out via email or on our Facebook group. I've received both complaints and approval, but kind of like since there's no such thing as bad publicity, I appreciate both sides of the coin. I would like to point out that there are hundreds to thousands of you that listen to the show at any given point, and I think only about 1% from my calculations have actually ever reached out to me or have actually written a review on iTunes or some other podcast player. So unless you are currently driving or otherwise incapacitated, how about maybe take just 20 or 30 seconds, pause the show, go on your podcast player, and leave a review for us. And if you can't do this on your phone currently, then think about it next time you go home and open up your iTunes player. You can also leave reviews directly from iTunes. So please help me reach and engage with more learners, and let's learn together. With part one, we didn't actually get as far as I had initially planned, so this is going to be a continuation. And that's perfectly fine, because today we're really going to focus on the high-yield study tactics that'll help you succeed in your academic goals. We'll cover the evidence-based study strategies, including a large section on space rehearsal practice, and also go over WHOOP which stands for Wish, Outcome, Obstacle, Plan, which are used for successful academic achievements. And towards the end, we're going to cover a lot of the mistakes and obstacles that students run into so that you don't waste your time making these same faux pas. So let's be wise and let's learn from others' mistakes instead of making them ourselves. All right, now to begin this first section on learning strategies, we'll continue with some excerpts from part one of this miniseries from Dr. Megan Samaraki of The Learning Scientists. The six strategies fell out of a report that was commissioned by the Institute for Education Sciences, IES. I think in 2007, a number of cognitive psychologists, including Hal Paschler and others, were asked to go through the literature and basically identify what strategies for learning do we have a lot of evidence for to suggest that they're going to work? What strategies do we have maybe only a little bit of evidence for? And then what strategies do we have a lot of evidence for to suggest that they do not work? So repeated reading, for example, we have a lot of evidence that just sitting and reading through your notes over and over again doesn't produce very much learning. And so they produce this report and the six strategies are basically the strategies that the cognitive psychologists on this team identified as having a lot of support for. So we know pretty well that these six strategies work and two in particular have tons and tons of evidence of spacing and retrieval. So there you go. If you want the evidence-based tactics, why not use the IES's research? This is probably currently one of the most comprehensive studies done on these tactics. And note that she said some of these more passive tactics, such as rereading, really don't work. They don't seem to improve long-term retention or comprehension of material. So stay away from those. So what do you want to think about when planning out spaced practices or retrieval practices? Spacing is this idea that repetition is good, but you should space those repetitions out over time. So you can compare this to massing practice or cramming 
you're just repeating the thing over and over and over again. So this is kind of what's happening if a student has you know, notes from a lecture and is just repeatedly reading through those notes over and over again, that would be massing or cramming. The idea with spacing is just to introduce space in between. And, you know, we could go, we could drive ourselves crazy trying to figure out exactly how much space is the right amount of space. But the idea is that you need to start to forget it a little bit just a little bit so that then when you reintroduce the idea and you go over it again, it's like you're kind of reteaching it to yourself a little bit. Now, how much forgetting do you want? Obviously, you don't want to have completely lost it all. A space of an entire year might be too much for some people, although for others that might be fine. It depends on how well you know the material. But in terms of practical application, just introducing some spacing, doing a little bit each day as opposed to waiting and then cramming it all at once. It makes your learning more effective, but it also makes it more efficient. So you can think about spacing it over these days, but it's not necessarily more time. It's just taking the time that you would have spent cramming it all in and spreading that out over time. That seems so counterintuitive to some of us that you need to start forgetting the material before implementing your retrieval practice in order to maximize the benefit from that practice. That seems kind of weird, right? You would think, well, if it's fresh in my mind, then I'll rehearse it again. I'll go over the material again, and that'll just strengthen it. But that's not how it works. You're not forming those neuronal connections between different topics or over time. You're really just using more short-term memory processes at this point. So start forgetting the material a little bit and then recall it again from memory, not from notes. But also, as she stated, there's no exact number. Everyone's going to be a little bit different on how many repetitions it takes them and how long to space out before their next repetition. I, for instance, might take more repetitions than any of my peers. And that's fine. You just need to know what level you're at. And it makes you wonder if maybe some of the visualization processes mentioned in part one of this miniseries by Jared Cooney Horvath might reduce some of the repetitions needed to get the material down. Space repetition and retrieval practice or rehearsal practice is something we're going to join up with again several times throughout this miniseries. But first, let's move on to our next evidence-based technique, and that is WHOOP. Joining us for this episode is Dr. Daniel Sadawi Kanafka, who ran a study using WHOOP with anesthesiology residents and found it very beneficial in certain scenarios. They actually call it WHOOP, W-O-O-P. It stands for Wish, Outcome, Obstacle, Plan, and it, it describes the sequential steps to bolstering goal intentions to make them more successful. So here's how it goes. It's Wish, Outcome, Obstacle, Plan. So Wish is, is the idea of uh, finding something that's intrinsically meaningful to you. What is the wish? What is it that you want to do? So I want to learn more about this particular topic or that particular topic, uh, and or I want to take myself to a certain level. But something that's meaningful, it's not extrinsically imposed. Outcome is to identify and then, to, for lack of a better word, fantasize about the best outcome that would come from achieving that goal. Obstacle is then to identify the single most critical inner obstacle, whatever it is that you are doing that, or that you're allowing to transpire, and then sort of dwelling on that. And then plan, you set up a strategic plan to overcome that obstacle and not overcome it at some later point, but overcome it in the moment, that the moment that it comes up. Something that we all know affects our ability to study and retain information is motivation, but it doesn't seem to be covered as frequently as you would think in a lot of the material. So notice here that he mentions the difference between intrinsic and extrinsic motivations and how that can play a part in how effective this technique or other study techniques are for the student, for the learner, for the individual. So what is the difference between intrinsic and extrinsic motivation and how does setting habits help us with WHOOP? Keeping your motivations pure. So people who are driven by intrinsic motivation, so the desire to learn something because it's fun or meaningful to them, those learning outcomes tend to be of higher quality than people who are learning for extrinsic reasons, things like tests. Uh, in particular, people who learn for tests tend to do just as good when it comes to fact-based learning, but uh, their outcomes are inferior when it comes to things like conceptual understanding, transfer, as compared with those who are learning, I'll call it for the love of learning. And right? if you think about it, automated responses to situational cues, those are habits. So what we're trying to do with Abby right now is we're trying to establish a habit, set up an automated response to fight her habit. 
her, her normal habit would just be to go sit by herself. But she has to come up with an automated response to fight that. Proximate goals to sort of feel some success or see some, some success of what you're doing are very helpful and they can help to establish things that, to sort of replace habits with better habits. So I think that the proximate goals can be useful for setting up habits, but WHOOP seems to, as long as you're able to incorporate in your routine, seems to be able to produce long-term results without as much a need for that. I will still strongly suggest that students and anyone that I tutor use goals, especially something like SMART goals, some way to make them realistic and monitor your progress. But it's interesting to note that with these types of study strategies using WHOOP, you might not need to rely on goal setting as much as you would otherwise. For the rest of these great interviews, go to freemeded.org slash podcasts and check out episode 7 with Dr. Megan Samaraki of the Learning Scientist podcast and 31 with Dr. Daniel Sadawi kanefka on WHOOP. I want to make one more quick shout out here. Regarding our other podcast, the One Minute Preceptor Podcast, we just finished recording our last episode for Season 1, so if you haven't caught up on those yet, please go check them out. They're also available on our website or your podcast player of choice. We interview great clinicians and give you tips and tricks for surviving your shadowing or clinical rotations experiences and how to ask for letters of recommendation from the physician's mouths themselves. Stay tuned for Season 2 to come out in a couple of weeks. All right, now there's a lot more we should discuss when it comes to space repetition and rehearsal practice, or as some like to call it, space rehearsal. When we use the spacing effect and retrieval practice together, they become sort of synergistic, and they're a very, very powerful technique for all students to know well and to use properly. So what does Dr. David Larson of Medical School 2.0 say about this? And I think what really matters is that people develop the habit of using retrieval practice as the primary method of learning in medical school, period. So you should be using this in your studies, 100%. You need to know how to use it properly, though, and that can be sometimes a little difficult. We'll go over some of the tactics for proper space retrieval and rehearsal practice a little bit more in the mistakes section of this episode later on. But first, let's hear from Dr. Barbara Oakley creator of a very, very popular online class called Learning How to Learn, and how her daughter used these techniques during her medical education and residency. The thing that, I, uh, that she started moving more towards, and I think that really helped her to be successful, because she has done very well on the boards and all the testing and so forth, is that she started moving her study, the beginnings of her study for any kind of major exam out quite a bit, like six months, eight months, something like that. And she'd begin her studies. So she'd be, uh, you know, just kind of adding along with uh, the usual regimen, she would be preparing. I do use the recall technique, which is to look away from the page and then see if I can remember a key idea. That's found to be incredibly effective for helping people learn. One thing that people do is they often, they will see something in front of them on the page. It is in their working memory. And that fools them into thinking it's in their long-term memory. And only by looking away can you see, do I really have this? Or is it just sitting there elusively in my working memory and fooling me that I actually have it? This is a problem that a lot of students run into, and I did a lot during medical school as well. We think that we know material because we recognize it when we're reading through our notes or rereading a page. But really, it's just stuck in our working memory and not our long-term memory yet. This is why closing your eyes, looking away from the material, and trying to recall it or recalling flashcards is so important. That rehearsal is vital to actually monitoring our long-term memory of a topic. When discussing durable learning with Jake Gittleson from the Learning Geeks podcast, this is what he had to say on the subject. Another one, and is really, really critical, especially in the higher ed, is to space it out. And that is to avoid cramming. Think of a test as a practice opportunity. And I didn't do this when I was in uh, college either. And I wish I did. I didn't think of it this way. And that is, whether it's a written test or an application test, I try to understand when I get a test myself now is that I understand that failure isn't always given high remarks in in higher ed, right? I understand that. But, But tests should be meant to make you better, not make you anxious, 
It's really a milestone in the learning process. I really like that advice because students worry about their tests so much, especially in school and then again on the boards and then again for residency. These tests are just a benchmark. They are something within your learning process, not a summation of who you are or what you know or your capabilities. They're a snapshot of a certain amount of information at that point in time. And we've all had good days and bad days on tests, and sometimes it's just not an accurate representation of what we are or what we know. And we definitely should not compare our test scores to another classmate's. So what are some recommendations of how to set up your space repetition and what to plan for, how many repetitions you should go over? Like we said, it'll differ for everyone, but here's some advice from Wendell Cole, author of the Med School Survival Kit. Yeah, no, I'm see again, I'm just a lazy studier, man. And I'd I'd rather like just look at it every day for a little bit of time than spend more time on one day and you know, versus the other. You know, I'd rather just I'm a proponent for just spending small amounts of time on it every single day. That way you're you're still seeing it every day and it's just more, you know, repetition is the father of learning. This coincides very well with what we've discussed from the IES recommendations and how to set up your space retrieval and how spacing is so much more powerful than cramming the day before. And it's weird. Actually, a lot of the instruction we've probably received in the past has not been following this line of thinking and has not been very accurate or beneficial for us. I mean, we even have some of the most sage instructors giving us poor information, as will be discussed with Ryan Orwig from StatMed Learning. I do have an issue with, uh, so like, like the, of, if you were to like make this sort of pantheon of the greatest teachers from pop culture, sure, the Yoda from Star Wars sits the top. I would make the argument that Yoda is a terrible teacher. And this is offensive to a lot of people. People are like, oh, how dare you? So Luke Skywalker, you know, the, the hope of the, of the galaxy is looking for a, a teacher he flies his ship to uh, the swamp planet where Yoda lives, Dagobah, and he crashes his ship, his X-wing, into the swamp. Into the swamp, we land. He meets Yoda, and then you know Yoda is training Luke in the ways of the Force. They're running around, doing flips, lifting up rocks, tapping into the forest, and all that stuff. And then then Luke sees his ship sink deeper into the swamp, and this leads to one of Yoda's probably number one most famous teacher statement. Luke's like, "I'm never going to get my ship out." And Yoda's like, looks around like, what? I mean, you know, you've been lifting up rocks with the force. Why don't you lift up the ship with the force? And Luke's like, oh, that's crazy. They're, not, they're so different because, you know, the x probably weighs like, you know, 30 tons. And Yoda's like, no, no different. You know, like, it's all the same. It's all in your head. And so Luke famously said, okay, I'll, I'll try. To which Yoda responds, no, do or do not. There's there no is try. no try. And everybody's like, yeah, it's the best. It's the worst. So what's Luke do? Luke tries, and then he collapses back in. So what did Yoda say? Did Yoda say, okay, okay, I see what you did. Here's what's going to happen. I want you to try that 20 more times over the next hour. And I'm going to be in my hut making some stew or whatever, and you come talk to me about it, and we'll debrief, and then we'll try again. Is that what happened? No, that's not what happened. What happened is that Yoda looked at him and was like, does it for him. Moves move the ship over. Luke's like, I can't believe it. And Yoda's like, that's why you fail. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> uh, I mean, it was terrible. It was terrible instruction. What happens then is Luke rushes off and has a terrible encounter that could have swayed the, the, the outcome of the, of, the, of, the, of the galaxy. You know, Instead, he should have stayed there and, and deliberately practiced getting pulling the ship out of the swamp. That would have been better. Instructions, this retrieval practice is where the money is for learning, right? But so many med students will say, well, I could try to recall this information right now, but I don't know it as well as I would like. Therefore, like, don't try, right? I'll fail. If I attempt to recall this information, I'm going to fail and only remember 20%. And that's going to make me feel bad. So I'm not going to do it. So what I'm going to do instead is I'm going to reread it three more times. I'm going to review. I'm going to look over it. So that feels better when I'm looking at it and I recognize it. That's like, uh-huh, yeah, I, I, I got it phenomenal. Because you're looking at it, you're like, oh, yeah, as I see these words that are directly in front of my face, I totally recognize them. Which is not what this is, the whole learning process is about. But that's kind of the Yoda, just do it, that sort of like absolute in control type thing. Like, why do it if I'm not going to do it right? Why do it if I'm going to fail? Well, no, in fact, doing and trying and failing is the best route to learn. 
besides really liking that segment, because I'm a huge sci-fi nerd, it really makes a lot of sense. We need to add these types of deliberate practice of space repetition and build our progression up bit by bit. Instructors expecting too much of us at one time or us expecting too much of ourselves at one time is just not really viable. It's slow, meaningful progression that'll get you to your ultimate goals, especially when they're large goals like graduate school and medical education. Before we move on to the mistakes section of this episode, we have one more quote from Ron Robertson of Picmonic. When I learned something, I would learn it and then I would just reread it and just you know, kind of brute force repetition. And that's just not the most effective way to go about it. So instead of, you know, after you've learned something, the the idea is do recall, practice active recall. And by doing this, and I'm talking about quizzing questions, and there's a lot of resources available, but by actually practicing active recall, you're reconsolidating the memory, you know, you're pinpointing areas of weakness. All of these are, are incredibly beneficial in the learning process and yet not what we intuitively do. We like to focus on what we know, not what we don't know. And we like to review things that we've read. And, and you can actually, I'm sure you've heard this before, but you, there's this idea that you become so familiar with a concept or a topic that you can recite it from memory, even though you might not have the true conceptual understanding down. So even though when we are in our studies, we think that it's taking so much longer to do these retrieval practices or to create the proper flashcards, the proper study materials, and then recite them from our mind, we can't go through hundreds or thousands of flashcards this way, generally speaking. But in the long run, it's saving us a lot of time because we don't have that illusion of knowledge. We don't think that we know what it is when really it's just in our working memory and not stuck in our long-term memory where we actually need it, where we can actually access it later on. For more specific information on what I recommend for setting up your spaced repetition, check out episode 15, where I go over my 11311 method. This is just a way that I like to separate my spaced repetitions, and you can make yours more condensed or more spread out depending on your needs. In the next section, we're going to cover some of the important mistakes to watch out for so that you don't make them, because I have, and most of the people that I've interviewed also have, and many students that I went to school with made these same mistakes. But first, I want to say that I'm really, really happy to announce that we've sold dozens of copies of Read This Before Medical School Now, and a good chunk of this has occurred during the recent holiday sale. So for those that didn't know about the sale beforehand, for several months there, We basically had the books on there for free. It was the lowest price that Amazon allowed us to for both the Kindle and the paperback version. So we didn't receive any royalties or anything for them. We just wanted as many people as possible to access them. And that's perfectly fine. We didn't create the book to make tons of money on it. It's to bring this information to you in a condensed and mobile and useful manner. The book condenses a lot of high yield information that have come through these episodes, through my personal experiences, through my educational psychology degree, through my co-authors personal educational and medical experiences, into high yield information for your academic success. And if we keep up the momentum that we're seeing during the holiday sale, then the cost that we had to put into it for editing and graphic design, publishing, all the other related expenses should be able to pay for itself by the end of the year, if not sooner, which is really nice because then we can start working on our next book, which will bring you even more high yield information and evidence-based study techniques that you can use. So if you are one of those dozens that have purchased Read This Before Medical School, I would really personally appreciate it if you go to freemeded.org slash book review and you can leave a review there. You can also read some reviews that other people have left and we have links there for Amazon and other online bookstores and you can even leave a review on Goodreads if you don't have the ability to leave it on Amazon or one of these other sources. So please do go to freemeded.org slash book review. One word, book review now and help us spread the word. Okay, so when it comes to mistakes, we've covered some common misconceptions as far as rereading and sometimes highlighting. I think that was covered in the last episode, but there are a few others that we should probably get out of the way now, such as a very important learning myth that a lot of students believe and a lot of instructors still believe, even though it's been pretty heavily disproven. So for this one, we're joined again by Dr. Megan Samaraki. Dual coding is this idea that you can combine visual representations with verbal representations. 
So this starts to sound like learning styles. And of course, we know from a lot of evidence that learning styles um, is a myth. Certainly, we have preferences, but it's a myth that if we match instruction to those preferences, that we'll learn more. So it doesn't matter if you like visual or you like verbal information. Really, we should all just be trying to combine these representations. And dual coding is one of these things that we will come back to a few times, especially when we do our mnemonics recap, because it really has a lot to do with how we create our visual associations to text, to concepts, to other things. We're coding in multiple forms in our minds, in our brains. But like she says, you should really try to use multiple formats, audio, visual, tactile. Don't just focus on one because it's likely to be the one that's more convenient for you, that you enjoy more but that doesn't necessarily correlate to remembering it better long-term. In fact, as we'll see with Dr. Anders Ericsson later on when we discuss deliberate practice, effort, or the harder you make it on yourself, often correlates to remembering longer. But Megan does caution us against using certain formats that might be hyper-stimulating and might be distracting, or at least that we need to slow down if we use these. Now, one thing to note, videos tend to have verbal and visual representations that go along with them, but you can have too much of a good thing. So if they're, if it's going very fast and there's the sort of a lot of maybe words on the screen along with visuals that you're trying to look at or the person's talking and you're trying to read, if there's too much going on, it's going to produce what we might call cognitive overload. That doesn't mean you can't use videos. You just really do have to slow down so that you can really make the connection between the two things. And here are some thoughts from doctors Brian and Aaron Lemieux of Sketchy Medicine regarding chunking information in order to deal with the quantity that we have to usually deal with. I think some of the obstacles relate to the amount of information. And I think even though it's easy to say, oh, okay, well, we'll we'll take this section and we will turn it into a, a drawing, an interactive drawing, and we'll go around this scene. A lot of information is still a lot of information. And sometimes the best way to compartmentalize that information into different folders in your brain becomes that much more important when there's just an overwhelming amount and that it's not necessarily all belongs in the same place and that it get broken up and give, be given different themes and be, you can even go over them at different times and it doesn't have to be overwhelming if you break it down and you, you try to turn it into little mini stories instead of one big story that's overwhelming. Mm -hmm. I think another big big roadblock that unfortunately is not something that's going to change for teaching the choir right now, but learning for the boards in step one, which is super, super important versus learning for the class to do well and like what your Mm -hmm. professor wants you to know, Mm -hmm. which is cool too, because they have a lot of real world experience. It's just hard to balance both And you don't want to miss out on, like, if you study one way, you feel like you're missing out on the other way. I mean, so that's why it's cool when there are other resources out there, which is what we're working on to make studying for the boards with little tidbits for class faster, more efficient, and more fun. So that you can try to balance both of those because it's tough. I'm glad that they finally brought up the topic that many students wonder and ask about. And that is regarding studying for class versus the boards. And this is going to be a personal decision. This is going to be a personal choice. If you can get away with studying more or less for the boards or more or less for class, how are you going to weigh that? And now, as of a few weeks ago, step one has been changed to a pass-fail, which might ultimately affect how you approach your step one studies and how much time you dedicate to it. So this is something we're all going to have to consider independently. And based on that, rearrange our schedules to focus on certain types of material. Here are some last thoughts from Dr. Daniel Sadawi kanafka You know, I think a lot of times people, they'll say, well, I'm studying, but they don't actually see the rereading as an obstacle getting in the way of them having more effective studying. Or they'll be shopping for someone else's birthday present online. And that's a good thing. It doesn't have a negative valence to it. But when they understand the when they're doing it and they say, well, gosh, this is actually getting in the way of this goal that I really want to achieve. It changes the valence on these behaviors that are otherwise, they appear kind of benign. We'll be joined by many of these interviews again in our later episodes on mnemonics. 
But for now, I will refer you to episode 24, and that's where I cover a lot of common mistakes and how to correct them for space repetition for medical students. So episode 24, you can reach all of our episodes, including the episodes for this segment being 7 for Dr. Megan Samaraki, 17 for my interview with Sketchy Medical, and 31 for Whoop with Dr. Daniel Sadawi Kanaka. And a full list of episodes cited in this episode can be found in the show notes. You can also go to freemeded.org slash podcast to see all of our past and upcoming episodes. So we're almost to the key points of this episode. But before we get to that, I did want to point out a couple of segments that really stuck out to me. They were not what I initially expected when I had these guests on the show. And I think they're important to note right here. And they're going to be important when we discuss deliberate practice later on. They really involve the clinical rotations, shadowing, clinical experiences that physicians are noticing that a lot of students aren't receiving or not receiving a quality care of. This first clip is by Dr. David Larson. Instead of all the travels, I wish I spent a little bit of that free time shadowing people doing what I wanted to do. So I can really get a clear picture of a perfect day 10 years in the future and then reverse engineer how I would arrive there. I'm not sure if there are any stats on this, but I'm pretty sure a lot of students change from what they initially thought they were going into to what they actually go into in medicine. And a lot of this has to do with completely being ignorant or naive to the aspects of that specialty in clinical practice. Getting more clinical practice and experience early on and following physicians can greatly help motivate you and make you aware of what you will like and not like in a particular specialty going into it. Jake Gittleson from the Learning Geeks podcast also suggests how mentors can really be a great benefit early in our education. So a medical teacher has a very mature mental representation of a specific topic or various things, right? And they're probably super complex but they can help you, especially be best buds outside of their normal context. They can help you build your own mental representations. And this last clip is from Dr. Hoda Mustafa from the American University in Cairo. Also, things like apprenticeship. These are safe spaces. I mean, in surgical training, in medical training, internships and fellowships are spaces in which there's a very minimal margin for failure, but at the same time, you are learning things with the apprenticeship model, with the mentorship of someone more experienced than yourself, which gives you the safety in which if you are going to fail, there will be someone there to assist you in correcting this failure very quickly. So having this safe space to be guided in your failure and to make sure your mistakes don't have serious impacts by having that mentor to shadow you can likely greatly really increase the speed at which you learn certain materials and the more you're able to explore and investigate and be corrected in a timely manner. If you have trouble finding these types of resources, finding mentors or clinical rotations or anything along those lines, this is where our sister organization comes in. You may remember I mentioned sometime last year about Find a Rotation. Now, Find a Rotation is going to be a platform for students to find shadowing and mentors and clinical rotations and any other clinical experience that they want. Until the platform is complete, however, we're stuck with communicating through social media and other forms like that. So if you would like to know more and be alerted when the platform is up and running, go like our page at at facebook.com slash find a rotation. And there you can leave questions, post comments, ask us if there's anything in a particular area that you're interested in, and we'll do our best to connect you with a physician in that area. Until the platform's up and running, which might be a few months, might be a year, we're not sure at the moment, this is the best we can do, and we will be slightly limited until then. But any ability to help you find the rotations, find the shadowing, find the experiences and mentorship that you're looking for, We'll do our best. Of course, if you'd like to speak to me directly, you can always do so for free via social media or email, but you can also schedule one-on-one -on -one training session with me at any time at freemeded.org slash tutoring. The links are also in the show notes. I did want to leave you with one bit of inspiration too before the summary. This is also from Dr. Megan Samaraki. I don't really think students should worry too much about making sure that they're using 
the strategy in necessarily the most optimum way. Just using them and practicing with them and then making adjustments as you see fit is going to be really, really helpful. And, you know, switch it up. You don't need to do all of the strategies all the time, but you can use maybe dual coding with retrieval practice one day and then another day you could say, let's focus on concrete examples. Um, Really just adding a little bit here and there is going to be really helpful. So key is to mix it up. And actually, that's a great place to end this episode. The key takeaways I would say for this one is to remember that there are numerous tools and strategies that you can use. So mix it up and try different skills for different tasks. Remember that spaced rehearsal is one of the strongest techniques that we know of. So use it often and use it well. There are many obstacles that we can run across, such as the quantity of information we have, distractions, misinformation. So have a plan and try to stick to it or adjust when needed. Actually, your plan could be a whoop plan, wish, outcome, obstacle, plan. And lastly, find a mentor. If you don't have the ability to find a mentor locally, or if you wish to travel and go outside of your school for extra experience, join our growing network at find a rotation. Well, I hope you've learned a lot from the past two episodes of this recap in the mini series. I have definitely enjoyed making these, recapping the information myself, reminding me of all of the value that these guests have given us. If you need more information or more guidance, you can always reach out to me. You can schedule a training session or tutoring session, freemeded.org slash tutoring, and I hope to see you on the next episode. Thank you.